right. Let's take our seats, please. Welcome back. The CS125. So today we're going to, this is sort of a fun lecture. We get to do a mix of things. We're going to do some review of Java references because that's going to set us up to talk a little bit about how Java works, how the Java runtime actually works, and in particular about one of the features that was innovative about Java when it was released which is that Java will automatically manage memory for your program, meaning that you don't have to worry about taking, cleaning things up in the way that you have to in some other languages. So we'll talk about how references enable that. And then we'll go back and review interfaces, which is something that we're gonna continue talking about today and then wrap up talking uh, about on Friday. But I wanna offer some perspective. So at this point, um, literally, I looked this morning, so almost exactly 50% of the points in the class have been handed out to date. That doesn't include MP3, which we just released, but that's where we are. You guys are, this is almost the exact halfway point of the semester, um, and so congratulations for making it this far. Um, and this is a moment to kind of stop, take stock, right? We're obviously aware of the fact that the drop deadline is on Friday, um, but you know, one of the things I wanna remind you is that you're halfway there, that's a good thing, but you're also halfway there. So what you've done over the first half of the semester is 50% of what your grade is gonna end up being. So if you've really struggled during that time, there's no magic way to make that up over the next half of the class, right? But this is how things go here. Um, so where are we in terms of you know, what, what we're covering? So up until this point throughout this week, we've been focused on imperative and object-oriented programming. Starting next Monday, we're gonna start talking about algorithms and data structures. Um, and to be honest, that's material that is really cool, right? Way more exciting, way more interesting. Um, it'll give us a chance to continue to practice our imperative programming skills, to continue to use these object-oriented concepts that we've been introducing without a lot of context. Um, that's really also the point at which we get to start working on and thinking about some core computer science ideas. How do we solve problems using code? That was something we talked a lot more about at the beginning of the semester. We've sort of paused that because we've been talking about some of these ideas about how we organize objects and how we work with them, but we're gonna resume that conversation next Monday. And again, that is really, really cool stuff, right? That's core computer science content, right? Um, so that's a lot of fun. So up until this point, you guys have done um, essentially three MPs. Um, MP2 was, was due on Monday. Uh, in front of you, you have, um, I really consider MP4 to be kind of a medium MP. Um, you'll find that out once you start working on it. It's really not that difficult. Uh, we have one more challenge for you after break, um, and then the final project. So the final project um, is, we think about it like an MP, it counts the same as the other MPs, um, but the grading for that is quite generous. So really, I mean, to some degree, the hardest work you guys have done on the MPs is behind you. I would say that the next three MPs are probably easier than the previous three that you've done, right? You know, modulo the fact that you guys have grown in this time into, into more mature programmers, we can ask you to solve harder problems. Um, oh, midterms, right? So we've done one, we're gonna do two going forward. As far as the homework problems, those continue, so we're pretty much exactly halfway there. This is sort of where we are, right? What's in front of us. Um, you know, we, we sort of, you know, I, I promised when we started that we would try to move at a steady pace. You know, a, a rapid pace, but a steady pace. Um, so we don't sprint one week and drift the next. We kind of move incrementally. Every day you guys have a little bit of something to do. And what we're doing is we're building up your capacity over time. In the same way that you learn any other skill. That's why we do it this way. All right, so um, overall, I'm quite, I'm quite satisfied with the performance of, of this particular class. So. I, I took these numbers without considering MP3. I didn't think it was fair to include MP3 in this calculation, given that we just released it on Monday. Um, without drops, you guys have a median score of 88, uh, average of 84. With drops, um, people are doing quite well. Um, if this will ever decide to move for me. Yeah, median is 95. Okay, so you guys are doing well. Congratulations, I mean, this is, these are good scores. I wanna remind you, I don't have any limit on the number of A grades that I can hand out at the end of the semester. I've got an unlimited quantity. Um, I can always make more. So at this rate, you know, we are cruising for a place where 
a large number of people in this class are gonna do really well. And that's, that's sort of what I would like, right? I would, I would like this class to produce people that, you know, are gonna earn a good score in this course. That's part of my objective, although I have full control over this. But remember, our real goal is to allow you to succeed in what you do next, whether that's 126 for a tiny, tiny number of you, but more commonly, when you go on to take 225 and other programming courses later in our program. Or if you just decide to go off and write some code as part of whatever it is that you think that you do. And that's something that you'll certainly, hopefully be at least started off on by the time you're done. So you can always look at your grades up on our grading website. Again, keep in mind right now that, you know, once MP3 came out, everybody moved to the left again. I, I really do fully believe um, that you will all do very well on MP3. If you did okay on MP2, MP3 is easier. Um, and so I'm sort of thinking about this as, as the class is mostly gonna get, you know, 90s and 100s on MP3, right? Approach the same way you would approach any other MP, come to office hours, get help, ask on the forum. Um, when you are done, I think you will realize that it's a lot easier than it might look at first glance. Okay, so. Oh, I have some things to say about this. I don't know why this is not working for me today. So I'm, I'm gonna upload midterm grades to whatever site they tell me to do this, um, but we don't assign letter grades at midterm. We will assign SU grades. Um, you guys can always see how you're doing on the gradebook, right? That's a really important contract that we establish with you, which is that at any moment in time, you can see the exact grade you have in the class. If that's wrong, please let us know, because at the end of the semester, you know, we write just a very, very simple little program to compute what the letter grades are and we're done, right? So this is your official score. I remember reading once recently, some students were talking and they were like, oh, well professors really never know what your actual grade is, right? It's always off by a little bit. And I was like, no, no, wrong, right? We know exactly what your grade is, down to as many decimal points as we can calculate, right? Um, but again, if we have incorrect inputs to this calculation, please let me know and, and we'll address it. Um, right, so you can use, so one thing I wanna point out, just as, as a word of warning, is that you have a certain number of drops. Um, this is gonna have less than min impact than last semester because you have fewer drops, which is one of the reasons I'm impressed by how well the class is doing. You guys are actually really at the same place in terms of the median and average that the fall class was now, which again is, I, I think is great, um, despite the fact that you have fewer drops, particularly on the MPs, you have no drops. Um, but if your score on, if there's a big difference between your score with and without drops, just be mindful of this, because what happens is, you know, let's say that you've used all, up all your drops on quizzes. If you do really poorly or you skip a quiz down the line, that score is now gonna pop out and start to become part of the calculation, all right? So just, just be aware of this, okay? Um, and again, you know, we, we do all this. The reason we put these scores together and keep them continuously updated is we want you to be able to make a decision about what's right for you going forward. I would much, much, much rather you drop than fail, okay? Drop, you know, live to fight another day, come back next semester, be a little bit more prepared, right? Might be able to keep up better. Um, failing, of course, sucks, right? And, and this is why we do all of this. This is why we've been reaching out to some of you in lab. This is why we put all this information together all the time. You know, if I could take some students in this class and just forcibly remove them from the course that I know are not gonna do well, I could do that, but I can't, right? We rely on you to do that. So please, you know, I don't, I would prefer not to fail anyone uh, because I would prefer that people who have sort of gotten to a point where they're not succeeding this semester for whatever reason, um, just realize that now and make a decision to, to, to leave the course, right? I hate that, but it's better than you fail. Okay. Oh, right, so if you guys have things you wanna say about the class, this is about a good point for you to kind of talk back to us, particularly this helps us think about what to do for the rest of the semester, right? So we have this feedback form. We'll start looking at the results from that. Some of you have probably already been using it. Um, we do take all response, responses very serious and we think about them. Um, so please be aware of that as well, right? I mean, you know, me and the course staff put a lot of work into this class. Um, so try to keep your feedback constructive. The things we do are designed to try to help you learn this material and succeed. We're not doing this out of a, uh, for any punitive reason, right? I don't, I don't get any like extra money from the department for making the class harder, right? That's not how it works, right? We've tried to calibrate a level of difficulty that we think is at the right place so that people can succeed and are prepared for what they do next, 
right? It also doesn't give me any joy to pass everybody out of 125 and then have you guys all go down to 225 and crash and burn, right? That, that's, not, that, that's not the right thing for us to do in this class, right? I want you to have a reasonable expectation of what it takes to succeed in computer science and be set up properly so that you can kick butt as you go on to take 225 in another class. That's our goal. Okay, questions at this point? Not about anything, scheduling, grades, any sort of concerns you might have? Yeah. Say that one more time. Yeah, well, we might have one more extra credit opportunity. Well, actually, I shouldn't say that. We'll have several more extra credit opportunities, right? Um, we're going, I, th I think we're gonna get to the point where we're gonna try to relaunch our, our CS125 app this semester after spring break. I've got a group of students that are working hard on that. They made a lot of progress, so that, if we do that, will be worth some extra credit. Um, and then we also provide extra credit if you participate in the final project fair at the end of the semester. Yeah, so there'll be at least probably two more percentage points of extra credit that will be out there, maybe three, depends. Good question. Other questions, yeah, over here. Ah, right, okay, I should have pointed that out. So the next midterm is right after you guys get back from break. Sorry, just sort of when it happened to happen, right? We will spend time on that Monday reviewing object content. Um, and, you know, particularly, like, these couple of, I also want to point this out, so these couple of quizzes are tough. I know that, right? I know that because they were tough last semester, right? Um, keep in mind that once we get started talking about data structures and algorithms, things are gonna get easier again. Um, you know, we're, we've kind of come as far as we wanted to come with objects. We're exposing you to some of the more gnarly and interesting concepts when we talk about object-oriented programming. Um, and so this quiz and the one that's gonna happen over the weekend are tough, right? Uh, so you should, you should probably expect to see lower scores on those quizzes than you have in the past. Once we go back and start a new unit of the class, things, again, things will kind of get easier. So that's, that's something to keep in mind. But yeah, midterm is right after, right after break. You will be, and, and we'll spend some time, and I think you'll be well prepared for it. Other questions? All right. I mean, let me say this, I'm very proud of this class, right? I think you guys are doing a really great job, right? Um, you know, it's the spring, and you guys are supposed to be the people that aren't, you know, as good at computer science because you're not majors or whatever, but, you know, you're showing us through your work on stuff that you can do this, right? And so, you know, when you guys wanna go on and succeed in other courses, um, you know, me and the rest of the course staff really have your back. That's why we're doing this. Okay, I would like to take this moment to give the course staff some appreciation. So why don't we have a round of applause for all of the course staff this semester. You know, I would encourage you maybe this week or next week to kind of, if there's a particular CA or TA that you've really enjoyed working with, like take a moment to kind of say that to them. It actually goes a long way. You'll be surprised at how, um, how much sort of positive energy it creates just to say, Thanks, you know, I, I really appreciate you helping me this semester, and that, that'll help them get through the rest of the semester, right? Because they have a long road ahead of them as well. On that note, though, I want to warn you about something. So we've had some reports of, of students behaving aggressively towards course staff in office hours. That is completely unacceptable and will not be tolerated, right? Um, I've told the course staff to report those type of incidents to me, and if you do that, there will be consequences. There is absolutely no excuse or behaving in any sort of unpleasant manner towards one of our CAs or TAs, right? They're doing their best to help you. Are they perfect at it? No. Um, sometimes the problem is you not taking our feedback very well, right? Um, sometimes the CA may actually want you to figure out things yourself because that's gonna set you up more for success in the future. But any sort of aggressive behavior towards the CAs, again, is something that, that we will handle in ways that you will uh, find unpleasant. It's just wrong. Right? I mean, these people are, are volunteering to help you out. Right? There's no excuse for treating them in a way that makes them not want to continue to do that. Okay, good. So, before we start, let's do some homework review. I've done this for a little while. So, this was a homework problem from earlier this week um, called, and this is one of those ones I want to look at because I think, you know, there, there's some misconceptions that this problem frequently brings up, right? So, here is the problem description. Um, you're supposed to implement a public class called creator. And so creator was supposed to take, uh, have a public class method. Okay, that's important. 
call new or old that takes a single Boolean argument. If the argument is true, I'm supposed to return a reference to a new creator instance. If the argument is false, I should return a reference to the creator that was pre the, the last creator instance that I created. All right, and there's some, you know, um, if new or old has never been called before, you should return null, right? So let's look at how to do this. Um, so I need a public class creator. All right, so that's one thing I know, and then I'm gonna go back to the description again. So it should provide one public class method called new or old. And I know that needs to be public. And because it's a class method, what else do I need to do? Mark it as static, right? This is a method that belongs to the class, not to an instance of the class. All right, what does it return? Let's go back to the description again. Returns a reference to a creator, right? Either an old one or a new one. So I'm gonna say public static creator, new or old. It takes a Boolean as an argument. Uh, let me call that create. Okay. So now I've got the function I need. What do I need? How, how, is this, how should this work? So this, this, this class, am I done designing the class yet? Let's think about how we design the class first and then we'll finish up um, the work on the method. So one question is, if this method gets called again, how does it remember the previous creator that it created. How am I gonna do that? Yeah. Yeah, so I need a, I need a variable on my class here that stores, and I'll mark that as private, uh, because the problem said down here to not expose any public state, okay? So I don't want to let somebody else modify this variable. I'm only gonna use it inside the class. So, um, okay, so does that work? I'm close, but I've, I have a small problem here, yeah. Yeah, so this needs to be static as well because the method that accesses it is going to be static. So if I tried to run this without using the static keyword there, I'm gonna get an error because I should be able to call new or old before I've created an instance of creator. All right, so now, what do I do here? Let's go back to the problem description again. It says if the argument is true, I should return a reference to a new creator. Okay, how do I do that? Part of this is, is getting you comfortable with some of the new terminology that we've just started to use. What do I do? Yeah. Yep, so I need a, I need a if statement here, so I'm gonna say if create. Okay. Clearly I have something here that I need to do based on the value of create. So what do I do if create is true? It says return a reference to a new creator. Okay, so I can do that. Turn new creator. So that, okay, so now I've got the case handled where create is true. Now if create is false, new world should return a reference to the last creator. Okay, so now I'm a little stuck here, right? So what do I need to do to fix this? Yeah. Yeah, so, so I have to make changes to both my true and false case. So the first thing I need to do is I need to set my, my a reference to a new creator, and then I'm gonna return created. Otherwise, I'm just gonna return created, okay? Let's see here, let me make sure. Um, if the last argument is false, you return for the last creator. If new world has never been called before, you should return null. So is this gonna work the first time if, if, created, if create is false? Let's think about it. So what's go, what is it gonna return, right? So if create is false, I'm not gonna enter the top of the if statement. I'm just gonna enter the bottom. I'm gonna return created, created with setup to be null. So this should work the first time as well. Okay, so this is right. Um, let's see if it works, okay? So the first time I return null, the second time, 
I create a new creator and return it. The third time I use false, and so you can see from the default to string implementation that I'm actually getting a reference that's the same. If you look at that memory address over there, um, you can see that those two references are, are equal. And then the last time I call true, and so I create a new one. All right, I'm almost done. But I can make this a little bit tighter. How? This is correct, but it's not perfect. How do I make it perfect? Bingo. Yep. So I'm gonna get rid of this. Well, I need that. I don't need the else statement. Still need to close my if. And then move this over. Yeah, that's it. So why does this work? It works because if the first time I call it, created is null, that's okay. In the future, if I've been asked to create a new instance, I save it, and then I just return the new one that I Created. If I am not asked to create a new instance, I don't create one. Just return the last one that I created. Questions about this? One of, one of the, yeah, in the back. So the question is, what happens if um, I, the first call is true? Is that the question? Yeah, let's see. So if I pass true the first time, I should return a reference to a new creator. Yeah, okay, fair enough. So, so how, do we, how do we detect that? This is a bug in the question description. Yeah, we could use a, uh, a Boolean as well. So we're gonna say, if not called, return null, called, and then we just set called as equal to true. And I need to close this. Hmm, this is also wrong. What's that? So now, now we fully met the problem specification. It was a good catch. You could use an int too, but I wouldn't use a count here if I didn't need to, right? All, if all I care about is whether it's called before, I just have a Boolean variable and I set it as soon as it's called for the first time. Good. Questions about this? Okay, good. So. Let's review a little bit about references to set up a conversation about memory management. So if you remember, when I call a method in Java, the method gets a copy of the reference that's passed. That allows the method to modify the object that it's passed. And we've seen this already, right? So my birthday method gets a reference to a person. It uses that reference to increment the age on that person instance. That change is visible to the caller of the function. So after I am done calling birthday, I still have a reference to that object called me in this case. And that reference leads me to the same object that was modified by the birthday function. And so I see the change that it made to the age. Okay. Now, so let's talk a little bit more about what references do, and why we use them. So this is, I mentioned this before, but this is a really widely used concept in computer science. Instead of giving you access to something, I give you a reference to that thing. The reason I do that, and then I have to translate the reference. So every time you use a reference in Java, it has to use the reference to figure out what instance you're talking about, what object you want to modify. The reason I do this is it gives me a lot of extra control. So for example, your phone can move around from place to place. If I needed to know where your phone was physically in order to call it, that would be a huge pain. But what happens is when you dial a phone number, particularly a mobile, I should say entirely a mobile phone number, in that pause before it starts to ring, 
actually probably first couple rings even maybe. The phone company is figuring out where is your phone, right? Your phone periodically tells it, I'm in this particular cell, and so when a call is made to your number, one of the things it has to do, it has to figure out how to uh, route your call to the particular cell tower that's close to your phone. So somewhere around here, there's a tower that has an antenna on it. If you get a phone call, the signal that's being sent to your phone is being sent by that tower. If you drive to Chicago, the signal that's being sent to your phone when you get a call is being sent by a different tower. And so it allows things to move, right? Physical objects, this also is part of Java memory management as well. It allows objects to move from place to place. The other thing I can, some of the other things I can do with references. So I can block the translation of a reference. So again, if I use a phone number or email examples, so your phone company can actually say a particular number is no longer in service, right? It controls the translation of the reference to the ringing of your phone. And so if it says, you know, you're behind on your phone bill, it's gonna stop translating that phone number. Somebody can still call it, the reference still exists, but your phone won't ring. Because the phone company controls the process of translating the reference from that string of numbers to an actual device. And then here's the cool thing that we can do in Java with references. Right? This is not a course on Java internals. And so I'm not gonna dwell here, I just wanna talk about this for a few minutes because I think it will help you understand a little bit about what's going on under the covers when your Java program runs. So you might have noticed that in Java we have a new keyword. New creates a new instance of an object. In order to save whatever state that object is storing, there is some memory on your computer somewhere that has to be used to do that. So for example, if the object stores you know, an int and a double, there might be eight bytes of computer memory somewhere on your computer that has to be used every time you create a new instance of that kind of object. The amount of memory required depends on what the object stores. But in general, every time I create an object, there's some amount of memory that's used. So every time I call new, the amount of memory that's used by your program increases slightly. But then what's the opposite of new? If new creates an object and needs to allocate memory, needs to set aside extra memory on your computer in order to store that object state, why isn't there a delete? How do I get rid of stuff? Won't that program eventually run out of memory? So your, the, the apps, if you have an Android phone, those are Java applications running on that phone. If, they, if you have an app and you keep it open for days and days and days, as you do stuff with it, it's using new to create new objects to store stuff. Isn't it gonna run out of memory eventually? Your phone only has a certain amount of memory. So isn't the memory used by that app gonna increase over time and eventually cause the app to crash or the phone to crash, or at least to run out of memory, and then I have to do something. So why don't I have delete? When you go on, if you guys go on to take 225, you're gonna work in a language that does force you to delete things. When you call the equivalent of new in C++, you're responsible for making sure that that memory is returned to the system once the object is no longer in use. That's what you have to do to make sure that the amount of memory used by your program isn't increasing over time. But in Java, I can do this. So this is valid Java code, and if you ran this, you know, on our little slide playground or on Android Studio or wherever, you could run this program forever. It's gonna sit there, it's not, very, it's not a very interesting program, um, but you could run it over and over and over. You, you could essentially run this loop, so this is a loop that has no termination clause. Right, I'm looping through, I have a counter called i. Every time I go through the loop, I'm creating a new string. But this loop will not use more memory over time, despite the fact that you know, the first time it calls new once, and then after it's run 50 times, it's called new 50 times. After it's run, you know, 1,000 times, it's called new 1,000 times. So what's happening? What's happening behind the scenes is that Java is performing a process called garbage collection. This is one of the features of Java that was really innovative at the time Java was released. Garbage collection wasn't a new idea. It had been explored in other sort of 
prototype languages earlier, but Java was one of the first mainstream languages to include this feature. So how does it, so garbage collection means that as your program is running, Java is automatically figuring out what objects aren't in use anymore and removing them so that the memory that they consume can be returned to the system. Those objects are, in the parlance of this term, garbage. They're no longer needed. I can remove them safely, and then the program's memory usage drops a little bit. So every time I take an object and remove it, I get that memory back. And so this is why I can run this loop forever without running out of memory. So how does this work? So the way Java does this is by using references. And here's the formula. It's really simple to explain. If there's a reference that exists to an object, then that object must be useful for something. Someone still has a reference to it, and they might use it. They might call one of its methods, they might modify one of its instance variables, whatever. So as long as there's a reference to an object, at least one, Java will keep that object around. But if the reference, if the number of references to an object drops to zero, then Java knows that that object is no longer in use. It can't be accessed ever again. Nobody has a reference to it, so there's no way to create more references. Remember when we talked about references, we said, if I've got one, I can create 10. But if I've got zero, I can't, can't create any. Right, so once the number of references to an object drops to zero, Java will eventually identify that that object can be removed. So let's see an example of how this, how this works using this little piece of code that we were just looking at. So here's how things work. Here's how things look after the first time that I come through this loop. And you'll note, and the reason why this is this way is because you'll notice that I'll put this little if statement inside the loop. The if statement says the first time I go through the loop, I have a reference that I save outside of the loop. And this is really important, because this is gonna make this string special, okay? So here's how things look the first time through the loop. I created a new string here, I called it s. I have a reference variable that holds a string. Because it's the first time, I've copied that reference to the save reference variable that is declared outside the loop. Now, the next time I run the loop, here's how things look. So I didn't copy the variable because i is now one, so when I get to the bottom of the loop, I have a variable called save outside the loop that holds a reference to the string with content zero. I also have a reference variable that I created inside the loop that stores a reference to the string with value one. Okay, so how does this look after I run another iteration? So now, again, this, very, this reference variable outside the loop still stores that reference to the first string I created that has value zero, but the reference variable inside the loop has been changed to refer to the string with value two. So what string can I safely get rid of in this picture? Hopefully it's fairly obvious. At this point, I've got a reference to a string with value zero stored here. I've got a reference to a string with value two stored here. What string do I have no references to? String with value one. And so that is a string that I can eventually delete. Now eventually what's gonna happen is over time, Java doesn't garbage collect all the time. From time to time, it will stop your program figure out all the objects that aren't in use and get rid of them all at once. So eventually what will happen is, let's say that the third time through the loop, so now my local variable has a reference to a string with value three, the variable outside the loop has a reference to the string with value zero, so now I've got two objects that are garbage. There are no references to them. There will be no way to find them again. They're gone. They might as well be gone. And what Java will do is it'll actually come through and delete them. It knows this is safe because there's nobody with a reference to the object. So again, if, if you could find, I'm not encouraging you to do this, but if you could find a house out there somewhere in the wilderness that nobody knew about, no one knew it was there, no one had an address to it, no one could find it, you could destroy that house. 
Again, I am not encouraging you to do that. Um, but you could. No one would notice. No one knows it's there, right? If nobody knows it's there, then no one's going to notice that it's missing. And so by the time, once Java identifies objects that have no references, that the program holds no references to, those are objects that can be safely deleted. And so again, over time, what's going to happen is, you know, and this will keep going, right? So eventually, if I kept running a loop, I'd have uh, leftover objects with values three and four and five, and I would delete those, and then seven and eight and nine, I would delete those, and this would keep going. The only object that's safe is the string with value zero because I have a reference to it outside the loop. So that loop keeps running. I always have a reference to the string with value zero, but the references to the new strings that I'm creating inside the loop are constantly being overwritten. And so I'm creating a lot of garbage. Periodically, Java will stop and clean it up. Questions about this? This is kind of neat. Again, this is one of the things that's so cool about references is that Java uses them. This is sometimes known as reference counting, this technique. Because in order to determine whether or not an object is garbage or not, Java is going to count the number of references that the program holds to that object. If that count is one or greater, the object gets to stay. If the count is zero, the object goes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is, sometimes in Android Studio you get a warning about a, an unused variable. That's typically because your, your function's not using that variable. Right? And so that can be a mistake. Right? So for example, if I had this string up here called save, but I never used it inside my code, Android Studio is smart enough to say, hey, wait, you, you declared this instance variable, but it's not used for anything. Right? Now the question is, would that take up space and memory? It, it, it depends. Right? It depends on if the compiler can remove it. Good question. All right. So again, like we're, we're, we are not too concerned with Java internals, but I wanted to explain this because again, this is why there is no delete keyword. And in fact, in Java, there's no way to even tell Java to delete something. You might think, oh, this is all well and good, but sometimes I know that I'm done with something, I might as well be able to delete it. Nope. Java does this completely for you, and it won't allow you to interfere in the process. Okay. So, last call for questions about object references. Again, this is something that next week, when we start talking about data structures and algorithms, becomes really critical. The data structures, the core data structures that we talk about in this class, lists, trees, and maps, essentially exist to store references to objects, but to store them in a way that allows us to do some cool things. Um, so this is an important concept to kind of wrap your mind around. Okay, so let's move on. Back to interfaces. So as a review of last time, an interface is a boundary between two parts of a computer system place where there is communication, where there's information that's exchanged, and where, in particular, I need good documentation, okay? So an interface, there's a variety of different places in a computer system where an interface can exist. It can exist between two pieces of software. It can exist between you and the computer. That's what your screen is and your trackpad. Um, and it can also exist between various systems online, right? So one computer and another computer can talk over the internet. That's now an interface. The APIs that you guys are, the API that you guys are gonna use or that we're gonna help you use for MP3, that's an application programmer interface. Microsoft has said, you know what? It would be cool if you guys could transform images and, and you know, use these cool machine learning techniques to find out stuff about them. We're going to create an interface that allows you to use all of the cool tools that we've built. So Microsoft has been doing research in this area for a long time. They've got some really nice algorithms for, for example, automatically captioning images. Like, that's spooky, right? I can upload an image to the Cognitive Services API, and it will automatically generate a caption for that image. And in a lot of cases, those captions are pretty accurate. Again, if you find cases where they're amusingly inaccurate, those are fun to look at, too, right? But in a lot of cases, they're right. Microsoft has allowed you to access that by creating an interface. And so to use that, you have to understand what the interface is, but that interface is the boundary between your code that runs on your phone and Microsoft's algorithms that perform these sort of cool, um, th these cool analyses of images, right? Okay. And, be, and, and again, by creating that interface, Microsoft is allowing you to interact with their computer vision algorithms, 
with all of the cool computer vision uh, tools and machine learning approaches that they've built up. They didn't have to do that. They could have just kept that locked away in, a, you know, in, in one of their data centers and said nobody outside can use it, but by creating the interface, they enable you to interact with it and to process your own images. Okay, so we talked last time about the fact that Java has a fairly specific definition of interface. Don't let that limit your understanding of what an interface is. So now in, in Java, interfaces kind of look like empty object, um, empty objects. Just a signature for a method, but no implementation. We can declare variables inside an interface. Typically, we're only going to declare methods. So the way we think about an interface in Java is it's a set of methods that um, a class has to implement in some way in order to implement the interface. So in order to inter implement add, your class has to implement a method called add that takes two ints as parameters. That's what you have to do. All right, so we, we looked at this. Um, by itself, that add interface does nothing. But the reason that I've created it is so that other classes can then implement it. And again, this seems very abstract, but this is gonna become very concrete very soon, and we're gonna see how cool this is and how powerful it is. So by itself, the interface doesn't do anything. It has to be implemented by a class. And so here's the, you know, a reminder about what the syntax is for declaring an interface, and here's the syntax for declaring a class, and then declaring that you implement that interface. This is a class called adder that implements add. In order to implement add, I have to implement a method called add that takes uh, two int parameters. Okay, good. I'm gonna skip this example. So when we, so this is an interesting example of polymorphism. When we talked about objects, we talked about the fact that I can cast an object reference to one of the object's parents. So I can always cast a reference to anything to an object because everything eventually in Java inherits from capital O object. I can do the same thing with an interface. So here what I'm doing is I'm creating a reference to an interface on the left side here. On the right side, I'm creating an object that implements that interface. I can only do this if the object on the right side implements the interface on the left side. Once that's done, I can call the add method on this reference because add is part of that interface, but I can't call multiply. Multiply is not part of the interface that I cast the reference to. If this was an adder, I could call both methods, but because I've cast it to the interface type, I can only call methods that are part of the interface, even though that second method, multiply, is public. So if I had a reference to that type of object, I could call it. But if I have a reference to an interface, I can only call the methods defined on that interface. So again, this is similar to inheritance. If I upcast something, I lose the ability to call the specific methods that the object might have defined that are not part of the class that I've upcast the reference to. So once I upcast to object, I can call to string and hash codes, but I can't, I couldn't in this case call add and multiply to define out adder. Okay, so again, we'll do, I'll just show you this little example. So here it's complaining that multiply is not part of the interface. If I change this to adder, now I'm good. So if my reference is to an adder, then I can call any public method that defines. If my reference is to an interface, I can only call methods that are defined on the interface. If I added my multiply method to the interface, then I would be able to do this. So if I upcast to an interface type, I get to use the methods that interface defines. So at this, there, there are some important similarities to recognize between interfaces and inheritance. I'm not gonna dwell here for very long, but this sort of seems a little bit like inheritance and overloading, right? Um, the interface is sort of like the parent class. It defines methods, um, and if the child class wants to, it can override them, right? So implement is sort of like extends. This is sort of like inheriting from, from a parent. Um, and providing your own implementation is sort of like overriding a method. It's not a, not a perfect analogy because if I extend another class, I inherit its methods, right? But there's actually a way, I just wanna point this out, there's actually a way to do this in Java by declaring what's called an abstract class. So, so the predecessor to interfaces. 
So an abstract class can't be instantiated. An abstract class can also define what are called abstract methods. Those abstract methods have to be implemented by anybody who extends the class. So for example, if I extended add, I would have to implement the add, um, and that's a typo, I should say abstract, not abstract. I would have to implement the add method. So I can, I can accomplish something very similar to interfaces by doing it this way. So instead of an interface, I could create a public abstract class add, and instead of implementing the interface, I could extend this class. Is there a question here? Yeah. I'm glad you asked, right? So why have interfaces at all? It seems like I already have a mechanism that I can use in Java to achieve the same thing. Okay, so, so here are the justifications for interfaces. One thing is that when, remember in Java, I can only inherit from one parent. And that forces me to structure things in this tree-like way, where everything is rooted in object. But it also means that if I, let's say that I have some capability or some method that I want vowel to implement and digit to implement, but I don't want that method to be implemented by letter or consonant. So now I'm sort of stuck. If I add the method to character, then everybody down here has to implement it. If I add it to letter, then both of its children have to implement it. If I add it to vowel, then I don't really have a way to determine that both vowel and digit have this property. So in, in interfaces are more flexible. I don't, have to in, I don't have to organize things into a tree in order to use an interface any one of these classes could implement add. So the other thing that's cool about interfaces and really important is that classes can implement multiple interfaces. So in Java, I don't have multiple inheritance. A class cannot have two parents, but it can declare that it implements two interfaces. So in this case, I've got an add interface and a subtract interface and a single class that implements both. So that class has to provide all the methods from all of the interfaces that it implements. Now you might wonder what happens if both add and subtract provide a method with the same name. That's a problem. I wanna talk about how that gets resolved, but um, so when we're designing our interfaces, we need to make, be careful about that, right? Because if both add and subtract provided like a multiply function, it wouldn't be clear which interface I was implementing. So that's, and those are really the, the justifications for interface, right? One is that it allows me more flexibility in choosing which objects that are part of my type hierarchy have a particular property or can do a particular thing, and a class can implement multiple interfaces. Neither one of these things is possible with Java's inheritance mechanism. Okay. So an interface really represents, remember there's a boundary there, right? That's what an interface is. One of the things that has to happen in that boundary is there has to be an agreement about what happens there and how we communicate. So one of the ways that you'll hear interfaces talked about is as a contract between a class that uses the interface and a class that provides the interface. We'll talk a lot more about this on Friday. That's one of the reasons why we need so much documentation in an interface is that it's important for those two classes to determine how things are going to work, right? So this is, one of the more useful and interesting interfaces that we're gonna talk about this semester. This is an actual version, it's close. It's not quite exactly correct, but this is very similar to an existing Java interface. And I think this is a great way to talk about what interfaces do. So in Java, there's actually an interface called comparable. By implementing that interface, you declare that you can be compared to another instance of your type. That comparison has to um, return which order to put two instances in. So if I give you two objects of your type, which should come first and which should come second? Almost done. So you might think, why is this so powerful, right? Well, it turns out, if I know how to take two instances of your class and put them in the right order, I can sort an array of objects of that type. 
I can also find the maximum or minimum of the objects of your type, because that's well defined now. I can also create some, a data structure called a binary tree that requires the ability to compare two instances. So this single property is surprisingly powerful. All right, we'll pick up there on Friday. Um, I have office hours today, as usual, one to three. MP3 is out, please get going on it. You guys have a few fewer days because of break. Um, I will see you all on Friday.